Welcome to the Mosquito Steve Radio Show on Talk Radio 1190. It's more than just mosquito talk. Mosquito Steve will talk about natural products, organics, good business practices, and more. And now, here's your host, Mosquito Steve. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. Uh, sorry, I'm adjusting the mic. We're we're running late today, so hi. See, we're going to be on Facebook. I'm running late. I am running late. I'm running behind. I'm not ready yet. So uh, so let's go back to music for a couple minutes. Give me a minute. <laughs> Just kidding. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Mosquito Steve Show. I am Mosquito Steve. They call me that because I'm dumb enough to stand outside and count how many mosquitoes land on me over and over hundreds and hundreds of times. And um, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder why I do it. I wonder if it's all going to mean anything in the end. But so I have an incredible guest, a good friend. Uh, the CEO of Drug Prevention Resources is here, Becky Vance. Hi, Steve. Okay, so um, Becky's. we're going to get to Becky here in a little bit. We're going to talk a lot about drug prevention today. It's one of my pet peeves, one of my big products, projects, because um, it just baffles me how many thousands of kids every single day become addicted. So we're going to talk about, you know, if you've got kids, um, how you can maybe there's some things you could do that would keep yours from not becoming addicted. But sometimes you just never know. So uh, we got a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about dogs today. So <laughs> we got uh, Becky uh, is into all kinds of things, like me. And um, so anyway, she's very, very talented and got a lot of great experience. So I'm real excited about this. So um, let's talk about mosquitoes for a little bit. So um, in case some of y'all didn't know, you might have been watching the news. And uh, we've got about... Um, 2,800 cases of the Zika virus in the United States. Most of those, about a fourth of them, are in Florida. And uh, we've got 35 cases that were that came from mosquitoes locally. So, you know, all this panic that people are having about Zika is a little bit overblown. Um, if you're pregnant, definitely you got to be careful. I'm not, I'm not diminishing the importance of being careful if you're pregnant or want to be pregnant in the next six months. But if you are not pregnant right now or wanting to be pregnant in the next six months, it's like having a bad cold or a mild flu if you get it. The, here's the hardest part, evidently, for people. If you get it, you, you can't have unprotected sex for six months. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> you know, it's like... I, that to me is like, okay, so I, <laughs> I'm not even going to get into it because people love Good to give thing. me a hard time about me not having sex. But, uh, but anyways, the, um, so anyway, so this is Congress has denied the bill um, several times uh, to, to move some funding into the Zika virus. I actually think that probably most of the money would be a waste of money. I really do, except that. Um, some of the money be used to, to make vaccines. Now, there are vaccines being made, and the CDC is developing them, so it's not like we're not doing anything. So that's real important to mention. So this money that Congress, this $1.1 billion uh, that they're trying to pass this bill, I don't know how much effect it would really have on this. We actually have some vaccines that are showing some, po uh, some real uh, positive results. Uh, we've got to test them uh, further. They're going to be testing them. And there's nothing we can do to speed that process up. Unfortunately. So, yeah. So more money is not going to help. And so uh, so that's that's first of all. Second of all, though, they're um, adding all this Planned Parenthood stuff on there. And that's why it keeps getting blocked. And um, that's the problem with Congress. I don't understand. I just don't understand. It. I don't understand why they can't. Can't, can't they communicate? Why can't Congress people see what we see? Because I'm telling you, Becky, if you and I had a problem like this to solve and we realize that Zika's an, an issue we need to resolve, we'd probably be able to go, okay, you know what? We may need to tack Planned Parenthood onto something else. Right. And let's go ahead and move forward with this because this is a problem now. Absolutely. Just like the opioid epidemic. Yeah. So instead I of, feel your pain. Yeah. Instead of all or nothing. I just don't get it. I don't understand why these people don't have brains like we do. So uh, there's a show that I've been watching called Brain Dead. And it's there's these worms or these ants crawling these people's heads. And they it's really crazy. It's on CBS on Sunday nights. And uh, 
and and I like it because it's actually it's very it's um uh, it's very unconservative. So it's it's you know it <laughs> makes me mad sometimes, but at the same time it you know it's kind of funny cuz it was like the, all these congress people get worms in their heads and it's like well you know what that's kind of how they're acting they've all got worms in their heads so <laughs> all right so let's talk about zika in west nile in texas so in texas we have had 174 reported cases of the zika virus disease how many of those came from localized mosquitoes zero oh. so this means in fact they just they were just reported in denton last night some lady, uh, their their sixth case of Zika, and uh, something like that this this year, and um, and they said, oh, but she just went to Jamaica. Come on, people, stay out of Jamaica and central and Central America and Latin America and South America. Stay out of there. Come on, people, really. And if you go, take some mosquito Steve with you Absolutely. and put it on. This is just ridiculous that we're I, – I don't get it. I'm sorry. Well, it um, is an opportunity. I hear about you every time when I hear that on the news. I'm like, those people need Mosquito Steve. They do. What's the deal? But but the government's telling them to put on DEET. That's the deal. The government says, wear DEET. Even yeah, though it only works for 45 minutes, wear it. So, remember the worms in their heads. That's right. <laughs> so, okay, Dallas has 35 cases of Zika virus. All of them come from travelers. Uh, Harris County uh, has 51. Let's see what Tarrant County. Tarrant County's got 19. So you're losing, Tarrant County. Come on. You can do better than that. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> so um, really what we need to be concerned with up here is West Nile virus. I keep saying that over and over and over again. Um, this is uh, uh, West Nile virus is our big issue here. So um this is something interesting. Actually, this came out when we were talking before the show. Um, you know, the city of Dallas sprays for West Nile virus mosquitoes. It's really not for, it is for Zika, but it's really for any mosquito. And so um, the city of Dallas sprays. A lot of people don't realize there's a list. You can actually um, submit a request to 311 Dallas, a 311 service request, and ask to be taken off the list, put on the do not spray list. I had no idea. Yes, so there is a mosquito do not spray list, and most counties and cities have a do not spray list. So if you don't want to get sprayed with chemicals and poisons and uh, permethrin, pyrethrins, and NALID, which, by the way, the CDC says, gosh, it looks like the mosquitoes are built to resistance to this stuff. Yes, they have. So it's the, the, the efficacy of it is questionable. But certainly the toxicity of it is not questionable. There's lots of evidence to show. And if you really need evidence to find out if chemicals are toxic, read the label. Right. If you can't <laughs> pronounce it, it's probably toxic. That's right. Well, and if it tells you right on the label, this will kill bees and fish, you know, it's probably, you, you, you might want to be careful. Absolutely. It's illegal for the government to spray over bodies of water. So um, I want to tell you out there that, you know, that the, the House to house spraying, spraying out of the trucks, that, that's bothersome to me. But what really bothers me is the aerial spraying. That is a carpet bomb approach, and it does no good. It's not. It's never shown to do any good. And um, the problem is, is they're spraying over bodies of water, so it's actually illegal to spray over a body of water with any of these pesticides because they kill fish. I had no idea. Yes. So. Um, so if they do aerial spraying here, which I hope they don't, but if they do, I want you guys to watch and get your cameras out and videotape. If you see them flying over White Rock Lake or some other lake, I want you guys to videotape that and post it and tag me on it because I want to get all over them. This, these are federal laws they're violating. And last time I used to, I lived by White Rock Lake and the last time they did it, I actually, I didn't videotape it. I should have, but. Watched them fly right over White Rock Lake over and over and over again. It's like, you got to be kidding me. This is ridiculous. How do, you, how do you know that it's them? How, what, what are the clues for knowing oh, that it's they, them? Because they, they have the airplane come down with stuff coming out okay. of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's crop dusting. It's, oh. uh, yes. So, uh, but the next day, there were hundreds of fish along the shores of White Rock Lake washed oh. up. Took the city of Dallas two weeks to answer me when I said, how do you account for this? And you know what they said? The fish drowned. <laughs> oh, no, you're kidding. So, which, 
it, it, it's true. They just that they thought I was stupid, I guess, and that's that was their answer. The truth is, is yeah, they actually did drown. But what happens is this oil gets on top of the water and the toxins get on top of water. So when they go up for air, either the toxins kill them or they can't get air because of the oil layer on top. So it really does kill them. Wow. All right. Well, hey, sometimes, you know, it's okay to come on and say, hey, Steve, you're not looking at me. You got to look at me. You got two minutes. (laughs) I'll remember that next time. Okay. All right. Yeah. Don't you don't want me mad at you, man. Let me tell you. I'm just kidding. Okay. So anyway, so just real quick here, uh, city of Dallas, if you are in an area, let me see. Oh, I don't know. If you're in an area over by, I don't recognize any of these street names. Let me see. Marsh Lane. I know that one. So if you're Marsh Lane and Royal Club area, let me see. The area to be sprayed is within the area general bound with the Cromwell, Galahad Drive, Harwell Drive, Betty Lane, Kincaid Drive. If any of that sounds familiar. Or if you want to go to the city of Dallas, they have this information on their website. But they will be spraying tonight from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. So if you don't want to be on that list, you need to get on the uh, Dallas 311 service and request them to skip your house, and they will do it. Hopefully one of these days they're going to be um, testing our products so they can spray our products. Last but not least, uh, Denton County, September 10th, 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Weather permitting, they are going to be spraying. So, you know, pull up your city of Dallas information and make sure that, you know, if you're um, in that area that you request, they skip you. So, all right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to be here with the great Becky Vance. So y'all come right back. Welcome back to the Mosquito Steve Radio Show. Up, up. Hi everybody, it's the Mosquito Steve Show, and I am Mosquito Steve, and I'm here with a good friend, uh, the lovely Becky Vance from Drug Prevention Resources. I love you, Steve. Clapped her. I love you too, Becky. <laughs> okay, so um, not only is she an amazing person, she there's so much. She, there's just there's a lot. So we're gonna pack a lot of information into 45 minutes here because she's all over the place. So, first of all, I have to know, you, you're you not from Texas, right? No. I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana. Oh, my God. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow, you and Harry Connick. I <laughs> didn't live there long, though. <laughs> didn't live there long enough. So, did y'all move to Houston? No, we moved to Europe, and that's where I got my experience. Isn't that weird? So, I mean, it's so funny that you think you know somebody, and then you don't know. So, Europe. Yes. What part of Europe? Holland. <gasps> Where oh they sell God. hashish in the coffee shop. Yeah. Oh, my God. I wanted to go there most of my life until I sobered up. And then I was like, no, I probably don't want to go there. But nope, you really don't. <laughs> I just thought it would be so cool to sit around and drink coffee and get high. But Yes. Yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. Not anymore, so, thankfully. So when did you come to America? 1975. Okay. Are you illegal? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't do illegal things anymore. <laughs> Okay, 1975, so you were... Going to college. 13. No. Oh, no. No, I was 16 and a senior in high school. Oh, my God. And I came to Texas, and I've been here ever since. Wasn't it hard to get uprooted when you're 16, though? You betcha. Oh, my God. It really was. That was part of the reason, I think, that I went down the wrong path. So you come here and get plugged in right away with the drug group. Yes. That helps. Yes, absolutely. It does, It does because you got something in common, so... uh, Yeah. Those oh, people were like aliens to me. I didn't know what a cowboy was. I didn't know what a pickup truck was. And yeah. the first day of school, they were, where'd you go to school last year? And I said, um, uh, the American School of London. And somebody said, is that in Texas? And I just went home and cried <laughs> and did some more drugs. It was bad. I love that. The American School in London. In Texas? You mean <laughs> London, Texas? Come on. <laughs> I know. It's a, don't, now we got to be nice to Texas. I love I'm it a Texan now. My whole I love life. it. I know. I know. And I love you, you and are. I love Texas. You're you're an adopted Texan. Yes. It's like the bumper sticker says. She's not a Texan, but she's got here as soon as she can. Absolutely. Okay, so I want to get this part out of the way, not because it's not important, but because it's not what we're focusing on today. But I just explain to me about the Greyhounds and your involvement with them. I just, uh, I, I absolutely, I can't have a dog. I just can't. My life is just too crazy, and I don't think I could devote the time to really take care of a dog. Mm-hmm. And um, because I, it breaks my heart. Like if I, when I used to babysit my dad's dog, mm-hmm. it broke my heart to go to work every day. And so. Um, 
You're so, so I sensitive. I know. I, I need it. I figured someday I'll have a little dog that can run around with me. Maybe I have a little little pack on the front or something. He can just run around. But that's that's a little weird. So, uh, but anyway, so I love dogs, but I can't have one. But I love greyhounds. I've known miniature greyhounds and regular greyhounds, and they are the sweetest dogs. So tell me why you got involved. How? What do you do with greyhounds? They absolutely are the best dogs and uh, the best kept secret. And I have two passions. The first is drug prevention. Close second is greyhound adoption. So I'm a volunteer adoption coordinator for an organization called Greyhound Adoption League of Texas. They're here in Dallas. Strictly volunteer organization. So I help match people who want to adopt greyhounds. I help find them the perfect greyhound for their home. Okay. Why greyhounds? Because they're just so beautiful. They're such awesome pets. They've worked so hard all their life and they take their retirement very seriously. It's, you know, they deserve everything that they possibly get in retirement. And they're really not hyper like people think they are. They call them 40-mile-an-hour couch potatoes, and that is true <laughs> with ours. And they all have different personalities, and um, and it's just they're, – they're just the most awesome dog. They're majestic. They're beautiful. The, the one that I have now, Jackson, he's my eighth greyhound. So they're habit-forming as well. And I have an addictive personality, and I happen to be really fond of greyhounds. So what did they used to do with them when they retired before Please they started doing adoption? Please don't ask me that question. You oh. don't want to know. You oh. don't want to know because they would just kill them. Oh, my God. So Many, are, many, many places would just kill them. So are the ones now, I mean, if they're racing, they're pretty, they've been somewhat abusive. I mean, a lot of times that's abusive relationships there, right? I think that happens sometimes, yeah, but we, okay. we, we do not turn any gray away, whether they're coming from a track, they're coming from a breeder, they're coming from a stray. Ours came from a, the, the mean streets of Cleburne, so he never uh, raced. But wow. if, they're, if they're greyhound, Galt will keep them and take them until they find a forever home. Okay, do y'all ever advocate with the well while they're racing to make sure that they're taken care of and in I think that we used, I think that we used to but the last track just closed here in Texas and oh, I don't really? think there are any more tracks across the country oh wow okay. it's on the way out and that's good news for greyhound and greyhound adopters <clears throat> that's what that cough button's for it's too late I had already coughed into the microphone so so uh that's that's right. okay well I just I don't want to harp too much on the greyhounds it's just I think they, I do. I absolutely think they're beautiful animals. Everyone I've met, I wanted to take home with me. Well, I should have brought Jackson with me today. You should you have. have met him. You should have. I don't know if it's okay to have dogs up here or not. Next time we'll do Jackson. Okay, we'll do that Jackson sounds great. Time. Yes. So, all right. Thanks. So, um, so how long have you been doing that? Though? Wow, I've been uh, a, a Greyhound adopter uh, volunteer here in Dallas for about two years took a little bit of time off when I took this new job at Drug yeah. Prevention Resources because I didn't have time to do it, but I'm back doing it now. Cool. Okay. All right. So Drug Prevention Resources, um, it's an organization, just in full disclosure, I'm on the board. Um, I absolutely love the organization. I love the whole concept. So um, there's there's estimates that I have seen, like just for, I mean, if you take marijuana and food and cutting and you take all of the addiction possibilities together, sex, you take all those together and put them together, you could be looking at ten to 15,000 kids every single day becoming addicted, starting addiction. It's a lot. It's, a, it's, uh, it's scary when you think about um, approximately you know, 375 young people die every single day wow. from prescription drug overdoses. That's like a jumbo jet falling from the sky and with no survivors and nobody talks about it I, that's that's what baffles me so national institute on drug abuse um says 5128 teens start addiction or, or, or from 12 to 20 mm -hmm. start addiction every single day well we know that 90 percent of addiction starts in the teen years yes but, but it's so totally preventable totally preventable. so that yeah why is that not leading our news i mean that's 5,000 kids a day people 365 days a year the good news is that it's leading our news a lot more than it used to but unfortunately kids are having to had many thousands of kids have had to die for that to begin to happen so why, why is it lead, because of the overdoses yes that's because what? of the overdoses um i'm i'm i don't know if you saw on facebook yesterday um you know there's so much stigma around the disease of addiction and uh, it's pretty controversial there was a picture of 
two adults in a car with their baby and both adults had overdosed and the oh, media wow. jumped yes. all over that picture and yeah. showed it put it you know put it on the air for everyone to see um, the stigma is so real that's why the problem is so pervasive because even in prevention parents don't want to even have prevention happen in their school because if the, if prevention's happening that must mean something's going on and if something's going on with their kid that means they're a bad parent it's just this perpetual perpetual cycle that's that's really tragic but um, you know it's good news that we are talking about it more and working getting in closer to the solutions so the 129 a day thing three I'm oh the 129 a, a day one, uh -huh. yeah yeah that's uh, that campaign is I think a joint venture between many faces one voice or faces and voices of recovery and uh, maybe the partnership has something to do with it um, but it's all about reducing the stigma so they tell a story a day of someone who lost their life too soon. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm going to throw some numbers out here occasionally because um, I I like numbers and. Uh, I don't do math. I hate math, but I like numbers. So, <laughs> so uh, again, on the National Institute on Drug Abuse, um, 2.4 million people began addiction began addiction last year. Of those, 78 percent, almost 80 percent of them were from 12 to 20 years old. Yes, that is just. And so, when a kid starts in their teens, yes. Um, and I don't know if it's alcohol, pot, or all drugs and all addictions, but w that, that increases their chances of being uh, a chronic. Absolutely, right? because their brains are still under development from, you know, many people don't know that the adolescent brain is not fully formed until age 25. So anytime you're introducing any kind of chemicals in there, um, it's it just it can turn on that switch. You never know if you're going to be the kid or more than one kid that's going to have a problem with it down the road. So that's why it's a good idea to abstain. So, Will, Will, are you 25? I'm 26. You're 20. Okay, well, you're you're okay then. It's you're, you've made. Oh, that I doesn't mean you can now? start. No, 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 no. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Responsible drinking is okay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so that that to me is bad because I, you know, I started when I was like 11 years old and really, really heavy till I was 25. And so it baffles me that I can even put sentences together today. And you started when you were young, 13, too. 13. Mm -hmm. so you and I didn't quit till I was 29. 13, 29. Oh, so that's why that's why you got started before I did. Cause you quit when you were 29. I quit when I was 36. So Yeah, there was something about 30 that made me think I, I have to start acting responsibly now. So you've been sober. 28 years now. You know how old I am. <laughs> 28 years. Okay, that's pretty incredible. So uh, tomorrow will be 21 for me. <gasps> Yay, congratulations. Yay, yeah, so while y'all are all being solemn about 9-11, you know, if you want something to be cheerful about, think about Steve being sober. So. I will. I will. <laughs> All right. We've got another break coming up here in a minute. So um, so we're going to come back with Becky. And uh, we got a whole bunch more to talk about. We really want to talk about we got North Texas Giving Day coming up and stuff. So there's a lot of stuff to talk about. Make sure we squeeze in here in the next 30 minutes. So uh, thanks for listening. Come back and uh, we'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more of the Mosquito Steve Radio Show. The Mosquito Steve Radio Show is back. Here's your host, Mosquito Steve. Howdy, howdy. Welcome back to the Mosquito Steve Show. And my guest today, Becky Vance from Drug Prevention Resources. Okay, so what was your turning point? What made you decide, first of all, to recover? Mm -hmm. What got you there? I think I was tired of being unhappy and tired of lying and tired of living a double life. There was the me that people saw, and then there was the me that I saw when I looked in the mirror. And I think uh, there was a lot of God intervening um, and, and surrounding me with people who could help me recover. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty miraculous. But basically, it all boils down to being sick and tired of being sick and tired, as we say. In the so were you homeless on the streets? And not at all. For, no, 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 not at all. I was, you know, married, had a job. Nobody ever suspected anything. Um, but I actually, toward the end there, before getting into recovery, I think I was doing my very best for somebody to catch me because I wanted somebody to say something. And, um, and I have a very good friend, Connie, who helped me 
as she said, just put down your purse and go. We'll yeah. figure it all out. Because yeah. everybody thinks when they're on the verge of trying to decide whether to get in recovery, how am I going to stop my life for a month? Um, and she just, you know, reiterated, just go and we'll take care of the rest. And so it's just letting go. Well, because, you know, so many people think it's just like parents often think, oh, this will never happen to my kid. Yes. And so many people think that, oh, well, you know, they're not homeless, so they must not have a problem. And uh, there's most most alcoholics and drug addicts that I know didn't get to the homeless point before they sobered up, thank God. No, I mean, I have a friend um, who's probably listening right now. Her nickname was High Bottom Beth because she didn't really have uh, that low bottom, and I didn't either, and that's denial. Denial is a powerful thing. I was able to tell myself for so many years I am not a drug addict because drug addicts inject heroin, Yes. and I never did any IV drugs, so, of course, I was not a drug addict. And um, I hate to even use that word addict. I'm um, trying to change my language around that because that's an important piece toward um, eliminating the stigma. But, um, you know, it's it's a it's a difficult choice to make, but it's one that I don't regret ever making. And I may have thought I wasn't an, a drug addict, but every morning I would say I am not going to drink any vodka before I go to work. Five minutes later, I'd have my face in the freezer drinking a shot of Stoli wow. and wonder I thought I wasn't going to do that. How come I did that? You know, so I could stop, but I couldn't stay stop, which, as you know, is the trick. Right. So that's what, you know, it's it's you mentioned the stigma and the, the um, that you you weren't. See, it was the intravenous drugs. It was the my next step was putting a needle in my arm. And that's really that was that was the turning point for me. It's like, oh, my gosh, I could never put a needle in my arm. I can't watch it, even if it's fake needles, mm-hmm. you know, where it doesn't actually go in the skin on TV. Right. I can't watch it. I just can't watch it. That is so bizarre. I don't know why. But um, but anyway, so that's what got me. So uh, the stigma, let's talk about stigma because mm-hmm. I'll tell you what, this changed. The recovery, the whole recovery scene has changed a lot in the last five years or so. Thankfully. Yes, yes. So um, and why? what was the reason for a change? What, what needed to change about recovery? Well, I think some, you know, people that were very smart, recover, very smart recovery advocates are taking more of a public health, health approach to the issue and um, recognizing that the language that we use is keeping people from getting the help that they need because it's so shaming and derogatory. And so these young recovery advocates, you know, young people in recovery, people like Greg Williams, organizations like Facing Addiction, decided we're going to solve this problem and we're going to change the way people think about it. And, um, And it's a very lofty goal to have, but I think one of the turning points, I like to think, was the um, the huge rally that they had last about a year ago at the National Mall with tens of thousands of people there. And the Surgeon General was there saying, I'm going to issue a report next year um, that's going to do for um, addiction what my report, what the Surgeon General's report on smoking did. Because look how much that decreased smoking. Yes. So just by coming out publicly at that event and saying, you know, this is this has got to change and I'm going to take up this mantle and go with it, I think has made a huge difference. Also, the hundreds of people that did Capitol Hill the next day and shared personal stories with those people up there in Capitol Hill in D.C. and uh, made the issue very personal for them. And I think that was the beginning of turning the tide. So does that is does that conflict or does it fit in with Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. I mean, is it the anonymous culture that caused the stigma? You know, it's so it's still so controversial. But, um, you know, there are many paths to recovery. That's the way I think about it. I used to be very narrowly focused on 12 step programs. But um, what I learned as a result of seeing the anonymous people is that by keeping my recovery a secret, I'm not doing anybody any favors. So I don't identify myself as a member of a particular 12-step program. Outside of the rooms, I I identify myself as a person in long-term recovery. And I talk about what gifts that's given me. You know, since I'm a person in long-term recovery, I'm a I'm a I'm a CEO of a drug prevention agency now. Who right. knew? <laughs> um, you know, I'm a I'm a good aunt. I'm a, I'm a good grandmother. I'm a good um, person. And um, we just really need to keep the ball rolling on that. And thank goodness there's so many young um, advocates out there who are very committed to changing the way that we talk about this. 
Well, and I, so I'll tell you my experience with it, because uh, when I first started hearing about the the um, not saying that I'm an addict or an alcoholic and we don't talk about drug abuse and we don't. When I start first started hearing about that, I was honestly I was a man. I was like, you guys, Alcoholics Anonymous. There's millions, and millions of people whose lives and families have been saved because of Alcoholics Anonymous. I agree. And yet there's nobody else has that kind of track record. Why don't when you get that track record, then I'll listen. Well, then I started seeing these people in college that were in recovery. And we're talking about huge numbers. We're talking about like up at North Texas at the time, they went from like 400 to 900, but even 400 is a huge amount of people in college to be in recovery. Because I can tell you right now, most of those kids, they don't think like I do. I was older when I got recovered. Right. And because, you know, I I was plum worn out. Those kids still have, they could have a long drinking and drugging career if they wanted to. And yet they're stopping before their lives are ruined. And it was just, and it blew my mind that they were having this kind of effect on these kids. Yeah. And they are the future of the movement. You know, people like Robert Ashford and, and Greg Williams, the movie maker, and now has made a second movie. Um, that's even more about the young recovery movement. And I'm talking about recovery high schools, the movie called Generation Found that's going to be screened here in Dallas um, on October 1st. But it's those young people who are the future and they are leading the charge. And it's amazing to see. I love to see what recovery looks like on those young people. And and they all believe that, yeah, 12 step programs are great, but there are many different paths to recovery and whichever path you choose, we're going to support you because it's better to be alive and perhaps taking medication assisted treatment than it is to be dead yes all right you know what we're gonna run out of time before we talk about what we're here to talk about today so i need to redirect real quick so you still got four minutes in this segment i know i and i love talking i really love talking about the college because this just blows my mind that the the, it's this is a movement people it's an amazing movement to see these kids going towards recovery um, I, if I try to think, what would my life been if I could get that 16 years back? Right. What would it be like? But all right. So uh, speaking of young people, so drug prevention resources works with with young with younger kids than that. Um, why? I mean, why is it necessary to address kids that are eight, nine, ten years old about addiction or <laughs> alcoholism funny. or any of it? Well, it's funny because parents spend all this time talking to their kids about stuff that's very much less likely to happen than someone offering them drugs. They talk about stranger danger and all those things. (laughs) Um, But it's important to um, let them know the dangers of drugs, not using scare tactics, but just as you would teach them about not talking to strangers or not letting anybody give them medication except mommy or daddy or not, you know, all the, all the, it's just should be a normal part of the conversation. But parents think, oh no, we live in this neighborhood. We don't have to have these conversations or gosh, I would know if my kid were using drugs. So um, it's important to get to them early so that they have all the tools they need and are ready when someone does offer them drugs. And we know that's going to happen before they hit 13. Yes. So let's give them what they need to make the right choice. Okay. So when I um, was working with Drug Prevention Resources and I contacted a local um, news reporter who's very well known and uh, they did a story on synthetic drugs and this uh, the it was back when what is it the LSD bomb or whatever it was that in up in Plano mm-hmm. and the kid the in bomb and the kid died from it and they did this story and I wrote this reporter and said hey you know what here's the thing this is going to happen more and more unless we start talking about it and his question to me and this is why he didn't think because he said what's your angle and I said what do you mean what's my angle my angle is that we got thousands of kids you know, starting addiction every day. That's the angle. What more angle do we need? And the guy said, well, so what what do you guys do that the government and the churches aren't already doing? Wow. Everybody thinks somebody else is doing it. But what we do is what cannot be done any longer in schools with federal funding because they've cut it all. So what we do is go in and um, teach kids how to make the right choices. Very rarely even talk about drugs. We talk about self-esteem, peer pressure, decision making, um, all of the things that they need to know just to be um, a a good, well-rounded person. Um, And we don't single out any specific drug. Um, And the government 
funds that a little bit, but not to the degree where we can reach every single school there is. There's so many schools that want us to be there, and we can't afford it so because it's only only the underprivileged kids that the grants pay for. There are kids in Frisco who are doing drugs, believe it or not, and Plano. So our schools are already teaching kids how to be well-rounded kids and care about themselves? I think they're doing the best they can. They're, everybody's yeah. doing the best they can. I'm not sure it's the school's job as part of the problem. And where where do you draw the line on what the parents do and what the kids do? So, okay, guys, we're coming up on another break here. And so I told you the time is going to fly. We were not going to get all the information in. So first thing we're going to do when we come back, though, is I want to know, you know, exactly what drug prevention resources do does and how people can get a hold of you and how they can bring y'all into their kids lives so we're going to take a break hear a word from our sponsors when we come back more with becky vance and drug uh, prevention and uh come back to yours thanks Son is- the mosquito steve radio show is back here's your host mosquito steve it does matter where you are because you are listening to Mosquito Steve right now. So welcome back to the Mosquito Steve Show. I'm here with Becky Vance. We've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to quit fooling around right now. How do people, So first of all, what does Drug Prevention Resources do? We save lives is the short version, but how we go about that is really different. Um, we not only do drug prevention in the schools with kids and parents, but we also give communities the tools they need to change attitudes about drug use and deter drug use in their community. So we do that through community coalitions. We have six of those throughout North Texas, and um, and we do it in the schools. And we have a waiting list of schools who would love to have us there. We have some um, state funding from to do that drug prevention, but only in underprivileged neighborhoods. Um, so we do need funding to do it in Plano, in Frisco, in McKinney, and all of the other places where we do know drug use is um, happening. And since you need funds, we, we're speaking of that, we've got North Texas Giving Day coming up. So first of all, how are you guys, they can give to Drug Prevention Resources through North Texas Giving Day, right? Absolutely. And how do they do that? They get up bright and early on <laughs> September the 22nd, starting at 6 a.m., you log on to your computer anytime after that, but go ahead and get it done before you go to work. And go to NorthTexasGivingDay.org, search for drug prevention resources, make a donation, and then please go and tell your friends that you did. We're, uh, we're going to have some exciting challenge grants, um, so your donation could be doubled, tripled. Who knows? We have such a great board, including folks like Steve here. <laughs> And um, some really awesome other folks on the board who are um, very generous and are helping us. We're going to raise $50,000 at a minimum on North Texas Giving Day with, with help. Well, and the staff, the staff is amazing. Um, I, I Our staff is amazing. They really are. They, 100% They're, of them give to us already. Yes. And that is really amazing. And the board the board is awesome, too. Now, the board was awesome, but the board's even more awesome now than it was before. And so uh, it really is an incredible organization. I invite you to uh, go to the website. What's the website? The website is www.drugprevresources.org. Drugprevresources.org. What's prev? What's a prev? Prevention. <laughs> if you want to cheat... We're redirecting from our old website, which is D, like drug, P, like prevention, R, like resources, I, like ink. But we're not an ink. That's why we changed it. So it's not DPRI, but you'll get there if you do that. That's good. Okay. And uh, if somebody just, if somebody doesn't do internet and let's say somebody's grandmother's out there and is, oh, I want to see if my kid's getting some of that. How can I contact you? How can they call y'all? Oh, they can call and they will talk to the delightful Patricia from down under. And she has the most beautiful accent and her phone number. Our main number is 972-518-1821. 972-518-1821. Eight, uh, down under, is that Mexico? <laughs> or down under Mexico, Australia. Guatemala. Australia. Oh, oh, She's okay. from Australia, and she is absolutely delightful and would be happy to help you. Okay, that's super. All right. So, again, let's uh, – so back to prevention, and uh, I want to go over all that other information again before we go, but I do want to, to talk about some of these things because I know some people – think that their kids are getting this and they're not. And that's what baffled me the most. So it, it's it's alarming to me that we're so focused on standardized testing in Texas. And that may be 
throughout the whole country. I don't know. Mm Because you've got national experience, so you'll probably know the answer to that. Why are we not? Because this is so important. I know for me, I know that the reason I drank and did drugs wasn't because, you know, the reason was because I hated myself. I Mm -hmm. just could not stand myself. The only time I was happy is when I was high. Right. And so it was my relief from being me. And and so um, that doesn't that how do we then you guys help do that. You just said you help make roundabout. What is it? You, well-rounded. Well-rounded. Well-rounded, well-rounded kids who know kids. how to make positive choices. OK, so how do I know, first of all, if my kids are getting some of this? Um, are you guys doing this in all schools or is, is this happening in all schools? No, um, no, no, no. There's I mean, it happens in very few schools. Why, if this is so important. Why aren't we doing this everywhere? Because there's so many other priorities uh, that the government has established as more important, including bullying. Um, bullying is a big one, but I'm seeing the more um, innovative schools um, like Irving take pair that up. So they're making that n- knowing that drug drug use is at the root of many of these other behaviors that are less than desirable, they're folding that in. So the smart schools are using some of the funding they get to prevent bullying and looking at how they can um, use that for drug prevention. Okay. Yeah, because it seems to me that if a kid feels good about themselves and is well-rounded and enjoying life, they're not going to cut themselves. They're not going to bully. They're not going to join gangs. They're not going to I mean, it just seems like that solves a lot of the problem. So why wouldn't we? Because you're talking about doing this with fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. That's where we're most effective? That's where we're most effective. But unfortunately, where we're doing it, where we end up doing it is after the problems already occurred. So we, we're, while we're grateful to do it anywhere, we end up doing it in a lot of alternative schools where the kids have already been in trouble. And those kids come to our prevention specialists and say, why weren't you at my home school? So I wouldn't end up here in right. trouble. Yep. Yeah, and I, because I will tell you, I have sponsored 15 year olds before, tried to help them through the 12 step programs and, and to get sober, and, and none of them stayed sober. I mean, it was just, it was almost an impossible task once they started that. So that's one of the things I love about drug prevention resources is we help them before they ever get started. This is a not, not about stopping them once they start, this is about keeping them from ever getting started. Right. And it's just really giving them the tools they need to resist peer pressure and make those positive choices. And, um, and they don't always get that from their parents, but, um, the lucky ones do. Wow. So, um, so that lucky, you mean like Highland Park and Frisco or no? (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean the smart parents who know that no child is immune. No child is immune. It doesn't matter where you live, if you're black, white, Hispanic, doesn't really matter. But wait a minute, but surely Highland Park is paying to have some drug, some prevention going on in their classes, right? Not in every class. No, I, I really, I really can't <laughs> answer that question. Everybody wants more, but it's just a matter of priorities and getting mixed up. Well, and Becky, she doesn't want to, she doesn't want to offend anybody, but I can tell you right now, if your kids are being brought up in Highland Park, you're probably not getting drug prevention. It's probably not happening. And I happen to know that, and it's been one of my pet peeves because um, <clears throat> I know that they, they, if they really wanted to, that they could afford to do it. Usually they've got standardized testing for one. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Standardized testing. I think that's the first time I've really used the cough button and tried to save your ears. Standardized testing and then sports. You got all these other things that are more important than than this kind of stuff. Look, 12 to 13 hours, right, Mm -hmm. in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade Mm -hmm. could change 30% of these kids, could keep 30% of these kids from ever becoming addicted. That's the secret is keeping them from becoming addicted, keeping them from saying yes to that first time that somebody offers. That is not much of an investment, 12 to 13 hours. Come on. No, no, it absolutely isn't. I can't believe that schools actually think that they cannot find a way to commit to that. That just blows my mind. The good news is more and more of them are. And if we had an unlimited amount of money, we could help them all. Okay. So here we are. Back to money again. (laughs) So, okay. First of all, is there anything that any message that you want to get across that I have not, that we hadn't already talked about? Is there a message that you want to get out there? Just that parents underestimate the dangers that are out there for their kids and parents do think that they're talking to their children about drugs 
but there really is truly a disconnect. So if you ask, if you're in a room with 10 parents and you ask how many of you talk to your kids about drugs, seven out of 10 will say yes. Put their kids in a room and ask them, only three out of 10 will say, yeah, they're talking to me. So there's this huge disconnect. Parents also think that their kids do not want to hear about it or they don't need to hear about it or they won't listen to them anyway. Parents think that it's a rite of passage and they just accept that it's going to happen, which that one really gets to me. Um, So what we try to do also through our new Partnership for Drug-Free Texas initiative is let parents know that they are the number one influencer in their kids' lives. And they need to have these conversations early, often, and we teach them how to do it. They can go to our website and find the tools on how to do it. You name it. So the parents are key. The schools are key. The community is key. And we try to reach all of those different sectors. And, and we need um, and we need money and, and help and volunteers to achieve our mission. And so do not assume that <clears throat> your kid is getting this type of education. Um, if, uh, if, they, if there's a very good chance they're not. So um, what they can do, there are other ways to do it. There's after-school programs, and there's some other things. Like if a school will just absolutely not do it, there are other ways to do it, right? Sure, okay. absolutely. All right. Tell us again, North Texas Giving Day, what's important today? What do they need to do, and uh, how do they get a hold of you? North Texas <clears throat> Giving Day is on September 22nd. You can donate through NorthTexasGivingDay.org. Look for Drug Prevention Resources, make a donation, or you can just simply call us at 972 972- 518-1821 or go to our website at Drug Prev Resources, D-R-U-G-P-R-E-V-R-E-S-O-U-R-C-E-S dot org. Okay. That is awesome, Becky. You're, you're just amazing. We really, we could, I guarantee we could talk for two hours about this. Um, I didn't get through any of the questions that I had on my list. I had a whole bunch of them. So You asked good ones, and I appreciate the opportunity to answer them, Steve. Well, thanks for being on here. So if you guys need to get a hold of me, you can send an email to steve at mosquitosteve.com, steve at mosquitosteve.com. How can they send you an email? bvance at dpri.com. Okay. So you guys uh, protect yourself. Prevention, prevention, prevention. Prevent your kids. Prevent mosquitoes. If you need anything, send me an email, steve at mosquitosteve.com. There's a lot of information on my website, mosquitosteve.com. And uh, come back next week. We've got another board member from Drug Prevention Resources. So have a wonderful week.